Good evening. Uh, this is quite a crowd. I like to say when I come to these events that I know where I don't belong. Um, but in all seriousness, I'm Andrew Rayfeld, President and CEO of the Jewish Federation of St. Louis. Um, I've been asked by the organizers of the event to, uh, to stand in for the, uh, uh, the board chair, Patty Krogan, and the leadership of this organization um, because of the events that are unfolding. Uh, tonight's program celebrates women in the clergy, a reflection of the integration of Western values of democracy, freedom, and equality with Jewish tradition, culture, and continuity. Before we begin tonight's program, we pause to recognize the assault on these values and our community that was represented by the attacks in Paris just a few days ago. We're here in solidarity with the victims of an attack that brought to that great city a silent standstill for 36 hours. We pause to recognize that the attacks were not merely an assault on the universal ideals of freedom, but a very targeted attack on the Jewish community itself. We pause to realize that the rejection of universal values go hands in, goes hand in hand with the embrace of anti-Semitism. It's a lesson our people has sadly understood since the dawn of the Enlightenment in Europe over 200 years ago. It's rightly been noted that no one should have to live in fear for expressing what they believe, and even more so, no one should live in fear simply because of who they are, simply because of who we are. The Jewish Federation of St. Louis and the Jewish Community Relations Council have issued a statement of solidarity with the victims of last week's attacks, and we invite you to add your condolences at our website, jfedstl.org. They will be delivered to the leadership of the community there and join a worldwide show of support for what happened in France. With an estimated 550,000 Jews, France has the world's third largest Jewish community. We were heartened by the outpouring of millions of Parisians and leaders from around the world who joined there in a show of solidarity for all the victims of terror last week. And we ask all of you now to stand as we observe a moment of silence for those who were slaughtered. May the memory be truly for a blessing. Thank you. And now, let me turn the stage over to the real stars and let the celebration of our community begin. Good evening and welcome. My name is Sharon Greenstein, and I am with Home Care Assistance, and this is Elaine Schneider, and she is with Vitas Healthcare. We are pleased to welcome all of you to this very special program this evening. Our two companies provide the ability for people to remain at home where they most want to be when they've been threatened with an illness. Among many of our services, we also provide, Home Care Assistance provides kosher care, and Vitas Healthcare is a accredited Jewish hospice provider. We are proud to sponsor this landmark celebration of women clergy and happy to join all of you in hearing these important conversations from these remarkable leaders in our community. It is now our pleasure to introduce the chair of this evening's event, Barbara Langsam Schumann. Thank you, Sharon, representing Home Care Assistance, and Elaine of Vitas Healthcare for sponsoring tonight's monumental program. I'd also like to mention that we were able to offer this event free of charge thanks to the Sherry Schechter Memorial Fund, Women's Philanthropy, and the Jewish Federation of St. Louis. I am honored to chair this inspirational and memorable program, and I'm gratified to see so many of you here tonight to support the women clergy of our Jewish community. You may or may not realize that St. Louis has several female Jewish clergy leading our congregations. 
the overall number of local women clergy says a great deal about the St. Louis Jewish community and exemplifies how our community truly embraces women as leaders. To our knowledge, this is also the first time in recent history that these extraordinary women have been brought together in this capacity. With Jewish Federation's new community development model and acknowledging the importance of bringing community together, Women's Philanthropy thought this was a wonderful opportunity to celebrate our commonality. Whether you identify as reform, reconstructionist, conservative, or orthodox, we are all women honoring women. Of course, there are a few men here tonight honoring women, <laughs> and we welcome them. My thanks go to Andrew Rayfeld, CEO of Jewish Federation of St. Louis, and Patty Krogan, Jewish Federation's board chair, for their incredible leadership and vision for our community. I'd also like to recognize and thank Julie Gibbs, Director of Women's Philanthropy, and Laura Fields, Development Association, Associate of Women's Philanthropy, for their tireless dedication to making this landmark program a success. Would all of you please stand, Andrew, Patty, Laura, and Julie. <laughs> okay, last but not least, I thank the Jewish Federation's marketing team, the co-chairs of Women's Philanthropy, Vicki Singer and Sherry Schumann, and the entire clergy event committee for all of their hard work in planning tonight's program. Please stand so we can recognize every one of you. Also, if there are any other clergy in the audience, women or men, active or retired, would you please stand so we can acknowledge you as well as our special guest tonight? All right. This evening, we've highlighted all of our community's Jewish women clergy in the program that's on your seat or in your laps right now, so you can read their bios and see their faces. Due to time constraints, we decided to have seven women clergy on the panel, and they represent a cross-section of the congregations in our community. Additionally, we're thrilled to have two of the other clergy join us this evening, Roxanne Shapiro, Rabbi and Director of Lifelong Learning at United Hebrew Congregation, and Dina Sussman, Rabbi Educator at Central Reform Congregation. We're honored to have them join us and lead us in the Shechachianu as we celebrate the first time these women have come together for this kind of program. Please join with us. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, shehechianu v'kiamanu v'hignanu v'azman hazeh. We praise you, eternal God, sovereign of the universe, for giving us life, for sustaining us, and enabling us to reach this season. Thank you, Rabbis Dina and Roxanne. Now, I am really pleased to introduce Ellen Sherberg, our moderator for the evening. Ellen has been publisher of the St. Louis Business Journal since 1990. She joined the local business newspaper in 1980 and held several positions before being appointed publisher. Ellen is also a group publisher for American City Business Journals with responsibility for the business journals in Birmingham, Memphis, Orlando, and Dallas. Ellen serves on the executive board of the United Way as well as on the board of directors of the Regional Business Council, St. Louis Regional Chamber, and many others. She's the founder of the Women's Leadership Initiative for United Way. Na Ellen is a native St. Louisan, and for those who are wondering, it's Ledoux Horton Watkins High School. <laughs> and she is a graduate of Vassar College and earned a master's degree in journalism from Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism in New York City. 
Ellen grew up in a conservative kosher home here in St. Louis. Her bat mitzvah was at BSKI, and so was her daughter's. Ellen's married to Dr. Jerry Rosenblum, a pediatric gastroenterologist at Cardinal Glennon. Their daughter, Amy, and her family live in Boulder, Colorado. Amy, Ellen's Amy, would like to note that she graduated from Clayton High School with Rabbi Amy Fader. <laughs> and on a personal note, I would like to note, as Ellen knows, I went all through school, first grade through high school, with Ellen's brother, Larry Sherberg. <laughs> And I've known Ellen most of my life and admired her so much for all that time. Please join us in welcoming a homegrown treasure, Ellen Sherberg. I want to say to all of you and to all of you that when I was growing up, it never would have seemed possible to be here tonight. I had, don't you think? I had many strong Jewish women in my life, always. And I had strong Rebbitsons and very strong daughters of rabbis as my friends. But to be on a panel with seven women rabbis, much less in St. Louis, was just far beyond anything I would ever have believed possible. To be on that panel with seven women rabbis at Federation <laughs> was even more unimaginable. <laughs> Truth be told, right? So Andrew. Thank you, and thank you all. I asked why they asked me to moderate this panel, and the answer was very clear. We have seven women rabbis, they said, each of whom is used to being in front of her own congregation. We didn't know who would be so bold as to tell them to stop talking. We thought, Ellen, we thought, Ellen, perhaps it would be you. So please don't make me look bad. We've asked each rabbi to speak for four minutes and introduce herself and her particular beliefs to you. Where are, we, where, we've got this so under control. Where are the timekeepers? Timekeepers? Where are my timekeepers? Timekeepers. Time Raise your hand high. We have timekeepers. They told me four to six. I took six. <laughs> you see? Then they can, they can have the rest of the time. And that is why, indeed, we're starting with Rabbi Talby, as you can tell. Okay. It is indeed. Okay. Well, should we my just honor. Kind of... No, I'm going to introduce <laughs> oh. you. Wait, you can't start yet. You can't. Uh, let me you take those two minutes. <laughs> You're going to take them anyway. Oh. I know you. I know. Sorry. The reason we went out of order, <laughs> alphabetically, is that Susan Talby is indeed the dean of St. Louis Women Rabbis. <laughs> Had she not embraced our community, and our community embraced her back, I'm not sure there would be seven women rabbis on this stage today. So please join me in welcoming my good friend. Should I sit? Should I sit? You have to sit. I have to sit. You have okay. To sit. All right. I'm, I'm sitting. So in 1972, the year that Sally Presan was about to be ordained, Betty Friedan looked straight at me and she said, and I suppose you're going to be a rabbi. I said, not me. A token in a patriarchal profession? Never. And God laughed. 
Or maybe it was Sarah who laughed again. I come from a long line of Sarahs. I was my grandmother Sarika's favorite. Once she was dying in a New York hospital when I was in rabbinical school at HUC. And the nurses called, and I rushed across town to, to be there because I wanted to say the prayers. I wanted to hold my grandmother as she went from this world to the next. But when I got there, she was sitting up in bed with bright eyes and red ribbons flowing from her hair. Suzika, she said, get me a rabbi. <laughs> I had a miracle. I am a rabbi, Nona. <laughs> and she laughed. The miracle was that my grandfather had come to her from the next world and told her that he wasn't ready for her yet and to get better. <laughs> she did, and 10 years later, she lived to hold our daughter, Sarika, her namesake in her arms. And like Sarah did so long ago, my nonna, Sarika, laughed and said like the first Sarah, I have a child at 90. When my grandmother died, the family wanted a real rabbi but even the Orthodox Sephardic real rabbi who did her funeral could feel our bond. And after my eulogy, when it was time for Kaddish, he nodded to me, and I led her people in the ancient prayer of our people, the ancient prayer of holy chutzpah that says that in the face of death, we choose life. And I felt the paradigm shift that day, and I felt God's sweet smile. When I finally found my way to rabbinical school, it was to deepen my own spiritual program so that I would have the tools to change the world. My rabbi growing up in New York was a man named Michael Robinson. He was one of the rabbis who was challenged by Dr. King in the early 60s to show up. He was arrested in St. Augustine, Florida for integrating a lunch counter, and he marched in Selma for economic and racial justice. His life was dedicated to changing the world for, by speaking up and showing up and changing the paradigm using everything that he had, his privilege, his Torah, and the Jewish story that he carried in his bones. And I knew that I wanted to do that too, though I never imagined that it would be as a rabbi, not me, and God laughed. It's been almost 40 years since I began this journey, and I wouldn't change a moment of it. I met my Beshert the first day of rabbinical school in Jerusalem, and together we have three adult children and a daughter-in-law who take our breath away every day, and they know, our children know, that they come first in our lives. I'm part of a congregation that created a workplace that shares a feminist, egalitarian vision that supports me as a working mother and that values complete inclusivity, radical hospitality, and the possibility of the awakening of compassion in everything, in absolutely everything that we do. And as a woman and as a rabbi, I've had the opportunity to build relationships with so many of you over these past 34 years here in St. Louis. And together we have bent the arc towards justice for women, for the gay, lesbian, and transgendered community, and for our black and brown sisters and brothers, Jewish and non-Jews alike. We have shared the joy of Shabbat with music and dance and learning to renew our souls and keep hope alive as we dive into the Torah text each week, week after week, balancing the mystery with the meaning. And together, we bring the voices of my silent sisters in the texts and in the white fire to life for the very first time. As a liberal Jew, I'll admit that I often take the wiggle room that's built into the tradition, if it serves if it will bring healing and restore hope. I'll never forget when I used to bring groups of women to the mikvah for different life cycle events, and we would immerse together, all of us. I remember Mrs. Pearl of Blessed Memory called Rabbi Rifkin, also of Blessed Memory, one day to ask what to do with me. <laughs> and God bless Rabbi Rifkin of Blessed Memory, he says, Rabbi Talvi brings women to the mikveh. Don't tell me the details. 
true story. And then when my mother died, and my three sisters and I kind of broke the rules and did her tahara ourselves, it was what she wanted. And as a rabbi, my sisters trusted me, and it helped us so much. And for all the holy opportunities I have had out there on the street as a rabbi, I am so grateful to be part of this moment in history, and I'm grateful that I have a part in it. Dr. King said, I am a man, and today we say, I am Mike Brown and Je suis Charlie. This is pure Torah. Love the stranger so that there will be no more stranger. Until we are all free, no one is free. Torah demands that we change the paradigm, you see, to change the world. And I have learned that the most important moments I have had as a rabbi are the stories that no one will ever know. They are the times that you've invited me into your homes and your hearts at the most private of times. The richest part of this work, and I had no idea that it would be this. Because in rabbinical school, I was told that I would never have friends in the congregation and that I should stay detached. But as a woman, though I'm not sure it's just as a woman, I could not survive that way. My heart breaks with every family, and I do know what is about me and what is not. But when you invite me in, I feel your pain and your joy, and I fall in love with every family that, let, that lets me be a part of your lives. And together, we use this brilliant tradition to guide us through the most tender of times. And so I sit here today with all of these wonderful women serving this community, with Andrea, whose bat mitzvah I was at so many years ago, <laughs> with this beautiful, beautiful Amy sitting next to me, who I remember singing as a teenager, and I'm the one that said to you, "Be a rabbi. It's a can you know, right? It's a cantor who's you know, it's a, a rabbi is a cantor who can is a rap. What is it? A cantor. Be a rabbi, right? Because you can <laughs> sing. Anyway, you remember what I said, right? Right? Yeah. Anyway. And of course, here we sit today with our own, we have a Maharat. I'm so proud. And you know, I remember Brigitte's um, children were in my daycare center, right, at HUC. How proud are we in St. Louis to have a Maharat, our own Rory? I'm so, it's very cool. <laughs> Each one of these women is a gift. And I also have to mention Ardina, who is my daughter's age. And like my daughters, I know will do so much better than me because these women are no longer tokens, you see, in a patriarchal profession. They have changed the paradigm, and they are changing the world. And they will continue to awaken compassion. And with that holy chutzpah of Jewish women who did their part in the Midbar, they too will bring us closer to the Promised Land. I have to tell you, I get up every day and I thank God that I became a rabbi and that I am a woman. And together with God and Sarah and my grandmothers and my mother and all the women and men upon whose shoulders I stand, we smile and we laugh because we know from this week's Torah portion what God tells us her name, Ehie Asher Ehie, I will be what I will be. We know that there is hope in this moment, that we will go from je suis, I am, to what we can become, because we are becoming. We are not done. The paradigm is shifting, the world is changing, and we, we women, we are still becoming. Thank you. I forgot the um, directions. So, it's a good thing. let me just tell you, right, yeah. conveniently. Um, after we hear from the next six panelists, each woman, each woman will speak about her journey, as Susan has. Um, and then, after all of our panelists have spoken, there will be time for question and answer. 
In the back of your program, a page has been inserted that features each clergy along with a tear-off bottom section, and that allows space to write a question. If you'd like, you can direct it to a specific clergy member, or you can direct it to the entire panel. During the program, we hope that you'll feel free to write down any questions as they come up, and also to whom it's directed. When each person has finished her talk, we're going to ask that you turn in your questions to the runners, walkers, um, who are going to pick up the questions at the end of the aisle, and then we'll have some time for discussion. So I apologize for that. Now, indeed, it's my pleasure to introduce Rabbi Amy Fader. Amy's the senior rabbi of Temple Israel. She has held that post since 2009. At that time, she became the youngest woman in history to become a senior rabbi of a large reform congregation. Amy. So I'll tell you the story. So I came home from college one weekend, and I called Rabbi Talvi, and I said, Rabbi Talvi, you know, I have a really big thing to tell you. I've decided that I want to become a cantor. <laughs> and she looked at me kind of funny, and she said, you know, you could be a cantor, but have you ever thought about becoming a female rabbi, a singing rabbi? <laughs> and, and, you know, I never really had before, so thank you for that. Uh, but I have to say, too, you know, also thank you to Rabbi Talvi and all of the female rabbis who came before. Um, the year that I was ordained was the same year that Sally Presian, who's the first female rabbi, uh, retired. So my classmates and I really looked at ourselves as the second generation of female rabbis. And the truth is, is that it was not so hard for us because of all of the women who came before. Because of all of them, our path was relatively easy. I will say that, um, sorry, this is making a little bit of noise. When, uh, when I had the opportunity, which I am so proud of still, of becoming the first young female rabbi to, uh, to lead a large congregation, what I said to people at the time and what I still say today is that honestly, I, I would not have done it if it was not at Temple Israel. Because Temple Israel, besides being the congregation in which I grew up, has also been so incredibly supportive to me every step of the way. And they were really the ones who made it possible for me to be a young, married mother and, and female rabbi all at the same time. They were the ones who said, well, why shouldn't someone who's 31 and a woman be able to be the head of this congregation? And they said, why shouldn't she be able to lead this congregation alongside her husband, who's a rabbi, who, by the way, I also met first day in Israel. <laughs> and you know, they also said, why shouldn't they be able to raise young children in this congregation? And those of you who have taken classes or been to services at TI know that I have led many a service and taught many a class with a baby strapped to my back and a guitar strapped to my front and never had anyone said anything except, you know, it's kind of awesome that you're able to do this. The one thing that I was always worried about in becoming a rabbi was that I wouldn't be able to live up to all of these dreams that I had had as a woman too, because I went to HUC straight after college, and, and I worry that all of the things that I wanted in my life, finding a partner and being able to raise children and have Shabbat dinners at home, I worry that if I became a rabbi, I wouldn't be able to do those things. And in the end, you know, it, it turns out that I can. Uh, I mean, I can't do the Shabbat dinner part because it turns out I'm a terrible cook, which I didn't realize. <laughs> um, but I have been able to find that partner and to, even though I work at it, to be, I think, a good wife and to be a good mom and to be there for my parents and my sister and my grandparents who are in the congregation. And so I'm very proud to be able to say that being a woman, I think, has enhanced my rabbinate, but never once has it stood in my way. And I just, I look at this job as being the best thing that could have ever happened to me. And I think every single day, really every single day, there is a moment in my day where I think, in being able to do this job, I have actually made someone's life a little bit better today. I've been able to give them some sort of meaning that maybe they would not have had if they hadn't 
been in my office or been in a space where I was, and that is just the most incredible gift and allows me to do this work, which is very hard. It is very hard, but it is so incredibly rewarding, and it's such a gift that the women who came before me have been able to give to me, and it's one for which I will be eternally grateful. Please welcome Rabbi Andrea Goldstein. She, is, she has served as rabbi of Congregation Sher Emma since 1998. She has made the call for justice and equality along with the search for spiritual connection focal points of her rabbinate. Rabbi Goldstein. Hi. <laughs> uh, so I am... Um... I uh, was thinking about sort of what to share um, with everyone tonight in terms of sort of what brought me to this place. And um, in some ways, the, my story is not incredibly extraordinary. Um, I grew up in um, a home um, where Judaism was really uh, just sort of a part and parcel of who we were. Uh, I grew up in Cincinnati at the very beginning of my childhood um, with my parents and my maternal grandparents um, where we celebrated Shabbat dinner with them um, in my memory, you know, almost every Friday night. Um, and I um, also had this very powerful connection to my grandmother and I um, have many memories of sitting, sort of standing in a line with my grandmother, it, was, it, it went more like this, because my grandmother was little, and then my mother, and then me, um, you know, before the candle, sort of bringing the light of Shabbat uh, into our hearts and into our homes. I had a pretty um, potent imagination as a child, and it was very, very, very easy for me to um, trust with all my heart that God was a part of my life and was close to me and... Um, was protecting me, um, was a spirit and a presence upon which I could rely. And um, I also have these very powerful memories of when I was very small, um, going to Adith Israel Congregation in Cincinnati uh, with my grandparents, um, especially my grandfather. And um, I don't really, I have to be honest, I don't really remember anything that the rabbi ever said, you know. Um, but I, I remember... Um, you know, seats that were really soft, and um, I remember feeling loved, and I remember, um, you know, butter cookies afterwards, and, uh, you know, that were sweet, and I remember um, being, you know, I would say in the middle, because, you know, that services are long, we know, you know, it's, uh, you get a little ootsy, and uh, when you're little, and I remember, you know, asking if I could, you know, go to the bathroom, um, mostly because I really liked that click clacky sound that the patent leathers made, you know, on the, on the tile. Um, but, you know, as I was thinking back, I was also remembering that, um, you know, I, I was pretty little, and uh, I always went by myself. And um, that was because the synagogue was a really safe place to be. I, I grew up with the synagogue as my, in my heart as this place of goodness. And I really believed all the time, for a long, long, long time, really long time, um, that the synagogue was the place where people always were their best selves. And... Um, uh, we moved uh, when I was seven years old here to St. Louis, and I, um, I became a part of um, Cher Emeth, and uh, Rabbi Talvi was, um, was one of the rabbis who was working at Cher Emeth at the time. And though intellectually, uh, Sally Presan became a rabbi when I was two, um, it was Rabbi Talvi who taught me that um, this idea was reality, that it was not... Um, it was not uh, just an idea that, that um, I wanted to be just as beautiful and just as wise and just as loving uh, a presence and, and space. And, um, and, you know, I sort of continued along this path. Um, I, I've been told that at my bat mitzvah, Rabbi Stiffman um, said I should become a rabbi, although I, I, I've been told that story. I don't know that it sunk in quite, quite then. Um, I, didn't, I didn't hear God call to me 
um, to take this path. Um, in fact, my mother, who's here, will tell you that um, I was in... Um, I was at studying at Northwestern, and all my friends had these grand plans of what they were doing after graduation, and I didn't quite know, and we, we went to Arby's, I think, and like, my mom helped me make this list, um, and I did decide to apply to rabbinic school, but for, uh, it's five years of schooling, and for three and a half years, I would tell people I'm just trying it out. <laughs> um, I wasn't totally committed uh, for quite a while. I, I loved the study. I loved being with the texts um, and sort of losing myself there and immersing myself. Um, but I, it, was, it was a little bit later that I discovered that it turns out it was a little bit better um, when I added the people to the texts and the people. Um, and, I, and I would also um, say that there has been so much on this journey that has been unexpected and um, things that could not be taught until they were a part of my life. But um, the best, I would agree with Rabbi Talvi that um, the, the privilege that I feel and the blessing that I feel and the gratitude that I feel that people welcome us into their lives at these most amazing and profound moments is constantly startling. Um, in such a beautiful, beautiful way. Um, and I didn't know until I started doing this work that to become a rabbi in a congregation and to have children um, uh, and a family, that the congregation takes those children and makes them their own. And I feel so grateful that my children understand what it means to feel a sense of connection to community. Um, I'm just, I'm very honored and grateful to be here tonight, and I'm, I'm grateful every day for the work that I'm able to do. And, yeah. <laughs> I am so very pleased to introduce Rabbi Elizabeth Hirsch. Rabbi Hirsch is currently senior rabbi at Temple Emmanuel. Some of you may have met her before she moved to Australia, and then she was at United Hebrew. I understand the growth at Temple Emmanuel since you've joined the congregation is phenomenal. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you to my colleagues. And thank you to Temple Emmanuel, because without you, I wouldn't be here this evening. I, I feel very humbled and um, a little bit emotional whenever I have the opportunity to speak about my passion, which is my rabbinate, which is my life. And I think I don't, I don't have a great grandiose story of how I journeyed here. I'll, I'll try and make it nice for you. Um, but I think it, it boils down to that I wanted, a, I wanted a lifestyle. I didn't want a profession that was a job. I wanted to live the values that I believed in. And uh, daily living as, as a rabbi was doing just that. Um, when I, while I thank all of my colleagues, um, I also want to take a moment to think about my parents' memory, who would be quelling um, every time I have one of these moments, every time I lead a class or conduct services. So I really want to dedicate my four to six minutes to <laughs> my, my dear parents' memory and also in honor of my husband and son, without whose support, and many of you know Robbie and Noah, and without their support, I couldn't be half the rabbi that I am. I grew up in, in what I'm going to term a mixed marriage. My mother was classical reform. She'd be very proud of me at Temple Emmanuel. And um, my father grew up conservative. But let me explain to you what that meant in the Hirsch household. It meant that my dad would only use the old Silverman prayer book and wanted a conservative service. And my mother, who grew up classical reform, was complete with ritual. Um, but ritual had a lot of superstition. So we lit Shabbat candles, but you couldn't light them barefoot. Because only barefoot, you was a house of mourning. Um, my mother would come in from a shiva call or from the funeral going, don't talk to me, don't talk to me, and head right for the bathroom to wash her hands. I keep wet ones in my car. <laughs> we had kosher meat, but only on the holidays. So... <laughs> That explains a lot of me, doesn't it? <laughs> so um, my mother used to talk about, because my mother was used to the old reform prayer book, the old union prayer book, and she said for years she sat at high holidays crying until someone showed her that the conservative book went the other way. 
So um, <laughs> I grew up conservative, <laughs> but we always had uh, egalitarian seating. Um, my rabbi, blessed memory, was Samuel Porath. He was a Sabra. He was Israeli. Um, we had women presidents, but I went to religious school three days a week, and that's the reason I can't ice skate, because ice <laughs> we had free lessons. Ice skating became Monday and Wednesday, and those were two of the days that I had to go to religious school. <laughs> but I've always loved Judaism. I, you know, and like many of you have stated, it was a safe place. You know, the synagogue was a safe place, and it was a place where I would go every Friday night, even as a teenager, and I loved just sitting in the pew with my mom or my mom and my dad, and then I might go out afterwards, but it was my way of ending the week. It was my way of becoming whole with myself. I was introduced to Nifty when I was about 15 years old, which was a godsend because I was one of a handful of Jews at a um, school in the suburb of Buffalo, New York, so I grew up as a minority with a great deal of anti-Semitism. Um, when I was in college, I went to Skidmore. My junior year, I met Rabbi Linda Motzkin, and it was an actualization. It was an actualization, like many of my colleagues have had, of seeing a woman rabbi of what was possible. And then the more I looked into the rabbinate, I also applied to the Reconstructionist School, but decided to go to HUC instead that the rabbinate, and many of you will appreciate this term, for me was not a treadmill, although I do love the treadmill, <laughs> that the rabbinate was a way of integrating learning and studying and growing and working with people, of engaging moments of people's lives with God. I could uh, be pastoral, I would enjoy writing. And um, it wasn't until several years ago after I left United Hebrew and I left the full-time rabbinate that I did a number of other rabbinical works. And my love goes out to Lori Goldberg, who's here this evening, who embraced me with open arms at Jewish Family and Children's Service, where I learned another aspect of the rabbinate and probably some of the hardest and best work I've ever done was in nursing homes and skilled and assisted. So the rabbinate to me as a 19 or 20 year old was an opportunity to every day would be new, every hour would be different. So honestly, when I applied to rabbinical school, I was 20 years old. What did I know? I knew absolutely nothing. It was either that or law school. So with all due respect to the lawyers, I think I would have made a better rabbi than lawyer. So, um, you know, while I was the first woman rabbi at United Hebrew in Temple Emmanuel, I think I've made my career. Um, it'll, it's ordained almost 22 years ago. I've tried to make my career not about my gender. Um, I thought, I've always believed the qualities were about the individual and not about the gender. So when people would say, oh, women rabbis are this or women rabbis are that, I always pushed back. So the decision to enter rabbinical school was actually very simple, but continuing to become is the wonderful challenge because each day, each interaction with individuals reinforces my decision. It's that we are all on a journey we are all somewhere in a, in a fabulous wilderness of becoming. So I am quite blessed to be part of a profession that encourages growth and community. It encourages study. It encourages love. It encourages each of us to be a living Torah. And I'll just close with something that stayed with me. Um, during our first year of rabbinical school in Jerusalem, we'd have visiting rabbis. And a rabbi said to me, and it's one of the few things I remember, <laughs> was um, too many rabbis love Judaism, but they don't like Jews. And I have to tell you, that stayed with me. And, and every day, every moment, I, I remind myself of that, and I do a self-check that I love our people. I love the people that are part of our congregation, whether they are Jewish, whether they affiliate with the Jewish people, but that's what I love, that yes, I was drawn to this lifestyle because I love Judaism, but I also love Jews and the Jewish community. Next, I'd like to introduce Cantor Sharon Nathanson. She was born into a very musical family here in St. Louis and has served as the full-time cantor at Congregation B'nai Amona since 2003, Cantor Nathanson. So I went to Ladue High School. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> 
Um, and I actually grew up at B'nai Amunah, and I remember as a child, I just had this overwhelming pride. I go to B'nai Amunah. I don't know really where it came from, <laughs> but I was so proud. I was so proud that I went to Hebrew school three days a week and Sunday school sometimes. <laughs> um, but so I wanted to share, of course, my, uh, my journey starting from all the way back when I was a little girl. And I felt very much the same way as Andrea did um, when she was a little girl, that the synagogue was a safe place. And, and she remembers butter, butter cookies. And I remember developing my taste for herring. <laughs> you know, and that's all there is. So I still have to have herring every Shabbat, or it's like, it doesn't feel like Shabbos. When I first began as a cantor at B'nai Amana, almost 12 years ago, there was a woman in her 90s, a lovely woman that, who I had great affection for. And each Shabbat at the Kiddush, she would come find me and grasp my hand strongly, and with great passion say to me, I never thought I'd like a woman cantor, <laughs> but I just love you. Um, I took that as a great compliment, and I always admired her ability to overcome a preconceived notion of what she thought she would like. And at an advanced age, it's really not easy for people. In some ways, um, hearing a woman speak and hearing a woman teach is a little bit easier than hearing a woman sing all through the service. There's an aesthetic quality that's different for people. Um, but I found that when I began at B'nai Amuna, some of my biggest fans were surprisingly the oldest men in the shul and the most traditional men in the shul. So how did I get to this place where I am now? The first female cantor in our congregation's nearly 130 years. I didn't go to Jewish camp. I was not active in USY. I was a Sunday school dropout. <laughs> It's not that I didn't like the kids or the teachers. I found, especially as I moved into seventh, eighth, ninth grade, that the discussions were interesting and relevant. But I was also in the synagogue choir, which rehearsed on Sunday mornings. And that's where I felt useful. That's where I felt I was contributing as well as learning. And that's where I felt most at home. In college, I went to University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Music positions at the local Reform Temple just seemed to keep popping up. I was the youth choir director and then a Friday night soloist and then also became the song leader for the Saturday morning service. And during that time, I was studying vocal performance, but it began to feel a bit two-dimensional. So I switched to music education. But when I did my student teaching, I felt so uncomfortable. I felt like I was trying to be someone else. And Hazen Lissick's voice kept coming back to me. You should be a cantor. You should be a cantor. He had said this for years, but I didn't have female role models. I would look at him and think, I can't be Hazen Lissick. <laughs> and I'm not. Um, but sometimes I hear his voice in my head and I expect it to come out. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> but the fact was I kept finding myself drawn to such a life. I felt myself drawn to the teaching, to the pastoral work, to the singing, and all in a Jewish framework. So my senior year of college, I sent away for the materials for the Jewish Theological Seminary and information about the Cantorial School. I still have the 1997 course requirement information book sitting on my shelves. I graduated college with a bachelor's degree in music education, knowing that it wasn't quite right for me. I wrestled for quite some time over whether or not to go to cantorial school. For a variety of reasons, I ended up deciding not to go. It was no small decision and was at times painful, but I always remained active in synagogue life at B'nai Amuna and singing for Friday night services and high holidays at Kol Am, high holy days at Hillel, filling in for cantors around town and teaching B'nai Mitzvah students at B'nai Amuna while performing and teaching violin. When I was approached to take over the position of the cantor at B'nai Amana, I knew it was a big undertaking. Long and unpredictable hours, years and years of study for cantorial exams while raising a family. 
But with the help of my very capable and patient husband, it works. I recently um, was going through a lot of old stuff um, that my mom had saved from my growing up. One of the things I found was a journal. I guess it was in some writing class in high school. We had to keep journals. And one of the things I wrote in there was that women will never be fully liberated until men feel fully liberated. So I was lucky that I found a man whose parents taught him how to cook and sew <laughs> and how to be playful and nurturing and caring. And so with all of his help, I am able to do that. And I walked into my role on the very first day at B'nai Amana as the cantor, feeling quite at home, so different from the feeling I had when I was a general music teacher in a school. So my kids love this Winnie the Pooh's Heffalump movie. <laughs> and there's a song with this great line in it, something like, um, I feel more myself when I'm with you. That's how I feel when I get to do the work that I do. So thank you for allowing me to do it. It's truly my honor to introduce to you Maharat Rory picker -Neath. She serves as the Director of Programming, Education, and Community Engagement at Base, Israel, at Base Abraham Congregation. She is one of only five women in this position in the entire world. Thank you very much, and it's really such an honor to be with everybody here, and this is something that I never could have imagined while growing up, uh, mostly because it didn't really exist until about four years ago. So um, I grew up in, in what would be classified as a very right-wing Orthodox home. Um, I davened at uh, an Aguda, for those of you who know what that means. Um, I have three brothers who all study in Kolel. So for a while, my husband would just joke that my parents had four kids who would just sit and learn all day. Um, but the joke was on them because I'm the one who got a job out of it. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, when I was in college, I... There, was, there were a few friends who we decided to spend a Shabbat together. And uh, we, we had done some weekend together through student government, and we thought it would be fun to spend another weekend together. And so I invited them over to my house in Brooklyn, New York. Um, my father was away. He had decided to take my brother to Israel. It was Purim weekend, and it was Purim would be longer in Israel because, anyway... Not the point of the story. So I invited them over to my house, and, and uh, we were, we were going to spend Shabbat together. And all of them were, were much more what we would call modern Orthodox. And so Friday night, uh, they said, we should go to shul. And I said, we don't, we don't do that around here. <laughs> Women don't go to shul on Friday night. And they said, there's one right across the street. And I said, OK, but I'm telling you, this isn't really done. And so we went, we went across the street, that was the synagogue where I had, had always been going, um, and we went, it was, the women's section was upstairs, the men's section was downstairs, and it was sort of this U shape with this kind of big wall and a curtain on top, so you could sort of like peer down over the curtain if you wanted to see. And we went up to the men's section on Friday night, sorry, the women's section on Friday night, and we opened the door, and the women's section was filled with men. Because women don't go to shul on Friday night, and so the men would go up there. And some of them wanted to have a little bit more of a personal prayer. Some of them were reading a book. Some of them were napping. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so I was really uncomfortable, and my friend said, nope, we're going to sit down, and we're going we're gonna to pray. And so we sat down. We got all these dirty looks from these men because we had come into their section. And, uh, you know, and so my friends kind of like sidle up to them and they're sort of shifting down a little bit. Um, and we went and, and we, we prayed and it was, it was a terrible experience. <laughs> and, 
And so I, I went to my dad after he came back, and I said to my dad, I said, you have to go to the rabbi, and you have to tell him that he needs to make an announcement that if he doesn't want women to go into the men's section, men can't go into the women's section. And my dad said, well, why would women go into the men's section? And I said, you have to tell him he has to make this announcement that this should be the women's section. I, I had not, at that point, I had no qualms about having a separate space. I had no qualms about the fact that I couldn't see anything. That was not at all my complaint. I said, but you have to tell them that this is going to be our space. And so my dad spoke to a few people. He couldn't ask the rabbi to make such an announcement. He spoke to a few of the board members, and they came to a compromise. They said that the next time I would be home for the weekend, that I should let them know, and what they would do <laughs> is they were going to lock the door of the women's section, and they were going to give me the key. And when I got to shul, I would find one of them, and I would take the key, and I could unlock the door and go in and lock the door behind me, and that way I could pray on Friday night. And, uh, and I sort of thought, this doesn't quite sound like a good idea, but they're offering me a compromise. I, I guess I have to be fair. I don't know. And so I went and I did this. And so the next time I said, okay, I have to at least tell them I tried it. And, uh, and so I went and I, I got the key from somebody. I unlocked the door. I went into this space. I locked the door behind me. And throughout the service, I would hear this sort of jostling of the door. And, and, I, had, and I had no idea who was trying. And it, I sort of joke, it's, it's, my, it's my very first protest uh, that nobody knows I took. Because um, I assume everyone just thought that someone forgot to unlock the door. Nobody knew I was in there. And I had no idea if the people who were trying to get in were men or if they were women. And I realized that I was the person who had locked the door. And I went home and I thought, I don't ever want to be that person again. I don't ever want to be the person who's locking somebody else out of this space. And I didn't really know what that meant. I didn't really know what to do with that. But a few years later, when they announced that they were going to be starting an institution to train women for leadership positions in the Orthodox community, I should say that there had been women who were taking on inspirational leadership roles for years. And, and like others have mentioned, we all stand on the shoulders of all of these women. But there was something, there was a lack of recognition. There was a lack of formality. Nobody really knew how to become that person. And no one knew how to find that person when somebody became that person. And so I guess it was now about five or six years ago that Yeshivat Maharat was started. I promised some people I would explain what that is. Um, and so they started it to basically say, we're going to formalize a curriculum so Orthodox women have a place that they know that they could go to get the training that's necessary to take on leadership roles within the Orthodox community. And we're going to tell the community that these women have been trained to do these roles. And so they started this program. Um, they decided to give a different title. There's this general discomfort. I'll be very honest. If the group had jumped up and said, we're ordaining women to be rabbis, I wouldn't have signed up. Um, it, it was not something I'd ever grown up with. I'd never grown up with female rabbis. Um, it wasn't something that I was comfortable with. But when they said, we're going to give women this training, we're going to acknowledge that they have this capability, and we're going to give them a title that's unique to them, I said, OK, I'll try this out. And so we went through this training. It's really a parallel rabbinical training program um, with all of, of similar curriculum to other Orthodox seminary programs uh, with a focus on Jewish law, pastoral counseling, texts, teachings. Um, and throughout, I wasn't really sure quite where it was going to take me. I thought, this, is, this seems like a place I should be. And somewhere down the line, I realized this was my chance to open up the doors for other people. Because not just for women, although that's part of it, but, but really there's plenty of men who don't have the same access in the Jewish community either. Uh, to be able to stand up and lead services, somebody has to teach you how to do that. Uh, to be able to, to study something with the text. I had been in yeshiva education my whole life, uh, and nobody had ever actually given me the text 
Somebody, I remember my, uh, my uh, halacha, my Jewish law class, was basically the teacher just wrote the laws on a piece of paper and then photocopied it and handed it out to us. Um, and I thought, I want, I want to know what the text says. I want to know what's in it, and I want to make sure that anyone who wants to can pick up this text and they can know what's in it also. And so I, I went through the program really with that focus. That's really, I think for me, access is, is just at the core of, of all that I do and all that I think so many of us do who know what it's like to not have been allowed access previously. And I'm also, like everyone here has mentioned, just so grateful to, to St. Louis for, uh, for deciding that when, and Bay Sabe in particular, when they were looking for somebody and they said, you know, we, we have a place for, for a woman. And they called Yeshivat Maharat and they said, okay, we're willing to talk about it. Um, and it's, it's hard for me in some ways because taking on that title and taking on that role by definition makes me scary to a lot of people. Uh, makes a lot of people really uncomfortable. And that makes me uncomfortable because I like to think that I'm not really that scary. Um, and at the same time, I know that had I not gone through that program, had I not taken on that title, that never would have given me the access to enable me to reach out to so many other people and give them the access to Judaism that they feel so passionate about. So I grapple with where that role sometimes takes me, but I'm so grateful to St. Louis as a community that has really embraced women in leadership roles um, and really, I think, at least for me, not, not made it as scary as it seemed initially. And while we're certainly grateful to everyone on the panel, I think we owe a special debt of gratitude to Rabbi Brigitte Rosenberg because indeed this was her idea. <laughs> so. Rabbi Rosenberg has served United Hebrew Congregations since 2004. She became senior rabbi in 2011. Also, she is the immediate past president of the St. Louis Rabbinical Association. And so it's appropriate for you to wrap this up. <laughs> Although if my kids were here, they'd be saying, Mom, keep it short. Keep it short. Nobody wants to hear. <laughs> so it's sort of scary now to be the last person, as we've heard from everybody. But I, I will clarify that this wasn't my idea. It was a conversation Julie and I had. And one of the things that, that I like to talk about with regard to St. Louis is really in this country, so many people are like, St. Louis, where's St. Louis? You know, and they think of us as this flyover Midwestern place. And I was speaking with Julie Gibbs and I said, this is really a pretty forward thinking community that there are this many women serving in synagogues, serving in our community, female clergy. And we really ought to be talking about that. That is not saying that we shouldn't be certainly celebrating and talking about the male clergy who are in our midst but really just acknowledging that for so many people who like to think of the East Coast and the West Coast as so forward thinking, we're right smack dab in the middle and you know, we're pretty, we're pretty forward thinking. <laughs> so probably unlike most of my colleagues here, being a rabbi to me never seemed out of reach or out of realm for me. At my bat mitzvah, there was a female rabbi and a female cantor standing on the bima, along with a male senior rabbi, um, both of whom I was very close to. And, and I will say that in speaking today about her that I just want to honor, um, and probably many on the panel know, Rabbi Judith Abrams, who died a couple of months ago, and her memory is a blessing. And so once she then left our congregation, another female rabbi then came to serve in our congregation. So I grew up in a quite large reform congregation in Houston, Texas, which some people also think is backwards, but pretty <laughs> forward thinking in that sense. So I never thought it out of the realm of possibility to be a female rabbi. Although I will say I entered high school with great dreams of being a heart surgeon. Um, 
I'm not quite sure why, because after a semester of high school math and science, that wasn't for me. Um, but I was quite blessed to spend many summers at our regional reform camp, Green Family Camp, and then became very active in NIFTI, just as Rabbi Hirsch found NIFTI. And NIFTI was a godsend for me. And certainly at camp and through NIFTI, we, there were so many in our region rabbis who were just so integrated into our program at our regional events, our local events. The rabbis were there and they were present. They were active and they cared, or at least I as a teenager thought that they cared. And more importantly, as uh, Rory talked about, they were accessible. And that's what I appreciated. They were accessible and they were approachable and no topic with them was off limits. And that to me was fabulous. And so as I entered confirmation in the 10th grade, when we came to the end of it, I was 15 and I turned to my mom and I said, I'm going to be a rabbi. I'm going to be just like these other rabbis that I have known, even thinking about my own uh, senior rabbi, um, he was approachable, and he was warm, and he was welcoming. And so that's what I began to think about in terms of being a rabbi. But I also, being 15, thought that being a rabbi meant that I could be at summer camp all the time, <laughs> and that I could be in youth group all the time. Two things which I love. So when I was in college, I com that's all I thought about. I knew when I was graduating that I was going to go to rabbinical school. Although I will say when it came down to senior year of college and that application was in, and all of my sorority sisters applied to multiple programs in law school or medical school or for a master's in English, I had one school that I applied to and that was the Hebrew Union College. And I sat there just nervous and I will tell you my interview weekend was terrible. Um, and uh, the day the letter came, I actually was not at home. And my roommate called, who is now my husband, called my husband Lee, although he wasn't my husband at the time, and said, the letter came. Should we open it? Should we see what it says? And they did. <laughs> and then they, well, actually, they held it over a lamp, and she burned part of the envelope. <laughs> but they actually knew before I knew that I had gotten into school. And so I entered rabbinical school, certainly excited, but very much like Rabbi Goldstein. For about four years, I said, I don't know if this is for me. I just don't know if this is for me. And part of that came from my classmates. And I was the first class at HUC that was over 50% women. We may have been the last class that was over 50% women. But I had many women in my class who said, and they stood up and said, they came to rabbinical school to make a point because they were women. And I'm thinking, that's not why I came to rabbinical school. I didn't even think about being a woman. I just wanted to be a rabbi. And so as we've even heard on the, pan the panel, when I think about being a rabbi, I don't often think about necessarily being a woman. It's who I am, both parts of it. Um, and so really, when I think about why I became a rabbi, in many ways, we've heard that already, certainly to make a difference, but to make Judaism accessible, to make it approachable, to make it warm and welcoming. And one of the things I think that all of us on the panel have said and can agree about, that it really takes a spectacular partner to make it, um, to make it worth it, or not even worth it, to make it accessible or easy for us to do. And I am so thankful. My husband journeyed with me from high school through becoming a rabbi and now, and really it is something together that we do even when we open our home and even when we have people together. And, and there is that beauty in having children in the congregation. And when I think about sitting here with Susan, um, she made it possible. She talked about her nursery school or her daycare center, but at Hebrew Union College, um, at least in Cincinnati, we were so blessed to have a child care center on campus. And one rabbi who actually, some of her family is from St. Louis, Sissy Coran, said to me before I went to rabbinical school, if you can, you should have a child while you are in rabbinical school so you have that experience 
and understand the beginnings of parenting before you even step into the world of the congregation or, or the rabbinate. I was able to do that, as actually was most of my class. Um, and we, Susan came and spoke at our ordination because for so many of us, that daycare center made it possible, men and women, for us to be students, but also to be parents. And I think that for us was a blessing that has continued into our rabbinates.